So welcome everyone to A Universe of Stories. Uh, this is our 2019 summer reading program theme. And on this slide, um, you can see at the top we have a bit.ly. Um, that links you to all of our slides for today. You can also see that all of our panelists here are joining us are from the Youth Services Advisory Council. We've got Kaylin, Annie, Liz, Lindsay, Dina, Monica, Jillian, Eva, and Stephanie and myself. Um, today Stephanie is unable to join us, but um, I will be talking through a couple of her slides for her. Let's advance this here. Um, I want to talk with you all just real quick a minute about um, the Collaborative Summer Library Pro Program, that's CSLP. Um, thanks to the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Library of Michigan is able to provide access to all public libraries in Michigan on um, CSLP's Summer Reading Manual. Um, the manual includes an early literacy, manual, a children's manual, teen manual, adult summer reading manual, um, and new this year we'll talk at the very end briefly about their um, health sciences manual as well. Uh, you can see here that you can access the manual at cslpreads.org. I have sent out a letter to all public library locations in Michigan that um, contained information on how to access the manual online. Um, you can also access public service announcements, uh, the new National Summer Reading Champion, which has yet to be announced, but that will be coming soon. Um, they have a whole bunch of additional resources on their website at cslpreads.org um, as well as the manuals. You can also see on this slide here that we have our Pinterest page where there's a lot of additional craft and programming ideas as well as book lists uh, for a universe of, of stories and um, they have a Facebook and Twitter account at CSLP Reads as well as um, the YouTube account, which is pretty cool because they include the PSAs every year on YouTube for easy sharing on your library's social media, as well as playlists, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then of course, for 2019, we are asking that you use the hashtags uh, Libraries Lift Off and CSLP Reads. So make sure you, when you're posting pictures and programming, to use at least um, the library's lift off hashtag and the CSLP group will be able to share those out. And I will also be looking for those from the Library of Michigan uh, social media websites. So without further ado, we're gonna dive right in to our early literacy manual. Um, I mentioned that they have a playlist on YouTube. It is also on page 16 of the manual and they link to a lot of stories, or excuse me, not stories, but songs and finger rhymes uh, through that playlist and you can access that um, link on page 16 of the manual. Also featured in the early literacy manual are various chapters um, that are divided up into the five practices of every child ready to read. That's play, talk, read, sing, and write. So each chapter is, is broken out into that, um, into those categories. And they have an infant chapter, they have toddler, and they have pre-K as well as Spanish language chapters. So that's all available in the Early Literacy Manual. And um, of course, like all the other uh, age groups, they offer a bookmark and activity log for libraries to just simply reproduce um, in-house and hand out to patrons to track for um, program participants. And uh, the final thing I wanted to highlight here in the Early Literacy Manual, um, is that they did note some sensory uh, 
sensory play tips. They also have like take home and early literacy tips uh, noted throughout the chapter. So be sure you're looking for those as you go along. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Eva to talk about some ideas she has for early literacy uh, universe of stories. Eva? All right, so hi everybody. Um, I'm Eva Weil. I am the children's librarian at the East Lansing Public Library. Uh, and one of my big focuses is with birth to five and early literacy. So of course I was really, really excited to see what sort of cool things we can do with this theme. Um, I This is one of the summer reading themes I've been the most excited for in quite a while. I think it lends itself so well to a lot of really fun stuff. Um, what I have found that has just been so successful for me in those really young um, early literacy birth to five age reigns have been uh, combination story times and sensory plays. Um, so that's kind of what I started with and I just wanted to talk through what uh, some ideas that I had for it and how I kind of structure them. Um, so yeah, I start them all with a pretty standard story time and I just wanted to throw in some of the things that I thought I would probably highlight when I do this. Um, it's going to be a challenge for me to see if I can wait till summer to use all of this fun stuff, but I'll give it a shot. Um, so obviously I included Touch the Brightest Star, um, which is a very exciting book that's going to go along so well with the theme um, and be part of Ready to Read Michigan. And yeah, that it's a very interactive book, so it's perfect for those little kids. Um, Stars is another great book that I like. And then there are so many good things um, to sort of inter or interfile in between. I know this is probably preaching to the choir, but I tend to go song, book, song, book, song, something like that. Um, zoom, 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 we're going to the moon, which I learned from Jaybrary is the one my kiddos personally just go bananas for. I think my record is singing it five, maybe six times in a row. <laughs> um, so I know I've got a winner there that ties in neatly. Um, you know, and the story time's really kind of the easier aspect of it. Um, I'm what I'm really excited to talk about is the sensory play. Um, I, I've had so much valuable feedback from parents and caregivers in my community that having sort of a unstructured sensory play after story times for even little, little ones who are, you know, on laps, not moving, is, is super helpful in developing all those pre-literacy skills uh, that they need and also just sort of a confidence. And as we all know, kids learn through play and it's been very exciting for me to see libraries embracing that. So um, what I really did is I went through and I picked out some of my favorite things. I threw them in there here to share with you guys and just a little bit about my rationale behind them. Um, they are also all linked, all the things that are uh, purchasable. So I've got all the links down at the bottom plus a little why sensory play that was just recently fe uh, featured at ALSC, which I thought was timely. Um, so the first thing I thought were star projectors. These are one of my favorite things and you can get them on, I think Amazon for maybe about 30 bucks and they just light up walls, skies, room. Um, I know at our library, we recently did a renovation and one of the big features in our library is a pretty cool uh, light feature in the children's room. And the babies in my story times love to look at it. Uh, they just stare up and I thought, okay, they're liking looking at these interesting lights. And then so I found these star projectors and they just, they're so cool. They're visually so stimulating. Um, they have all these points of entry. You can talk about colors, shapes, uh, movement. Is it because some of them will move across the sky and you can say, you know, look at the red, it's going slow, all that good stuff. Um, and plus, you know, it's fun for adults too. And when we're having fun, they're having fun. Um, there are little reusable star shaped ice cubes that I thought would be great for a sensory water tray. Um, you know, if you're one of the people who's willing to get into the water, I know some of us are hemmed in by carpet, but I think that's a good option. Um, 
the Starry Night sensory bags, I really love this idea um, and sensory bags in general. And you, know, you can kind of see the picture uh, on the bottom left in my little middle uh, part of the slide, but it's basically just, you know, Ziploc bag that's clear that you fill with hair gel and glitter and star shaped um, confetti. And uh, what I really liked about this example that I found is that um, it's mounted onto a black piece of um, cardboard that has stars actually drawn onto it. So for kids who are maybe a little bit older and have some more of those fine motor skills, you can actually press the sensory bag around to try and move the star confetti inside to line up with the stars on the backing. So it's like um, creating your own little interactive constellation. Um, I love that stuff. And, the sensory bags are so much fun. I, I play with them when they're just sitting on my desk too. Um, I've found these awesome star bean bags that are on Lakeshore. They, I think they're good for something like a bean bag toss or just to have as a fidget and a, something to hold on to. I think they are actually sold as uh, sensory items. So, you know, I am always kind of trying to think about how we can take these things and make them a little bit more inclusive. So just having something like that, that does have that um, tactile appeal and can serve as a fidget is always really helpful for me. Um, and then the one, I don't really have a good picture of it, but I am so into coffee filter painting right now. Um, you can take coffee filters and cut them into any shape. So for me, I think I would probably do a star because this is our starry skies story time and sensory play um, and there are liquid watercolors out there and you can just sort of splash them on it's a messy very imprecise art which is exactly up my alley and it that makes it really good for kids of all ages you know um, even little babies can splash paint and it makes this beautiful artwork as the liquid watercolors kind of diffuse through the coffee filter. Uh, another version of that I've seen is that if you have the oversized um, eyedroppers that are pretty popular and are really good for fine motor um, development, those you can drop little pieces of color and watch how they spread, watch how they blend, talk about how red and blue, look at this, they're mixing to make purple. So really this was just sort of my ex ideas that made me excited info dump, um, but my, my passion right now is really this open-ended sort of play and I've found that it's been so productive, so rewarding and it, um, it takes some of those things that parents maybe want to do, but it's a little bit overwhelming to set up at home, you know, having to put up a bunch of stations in your house so that your kid can kind of go through and say, okay, I want to poke the sensory bag for a minute and now I want to go through the bean bag. That's, that's a lot of stuff. So being able to offer that on our end has been awesome and I think this theme blends itself so well. So I'm very excited to give this a try and I hope you guys are too. And if you uh, want to talk through anything or have any questions, I am more than happy to do that. So that's Great. all for me. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. So yes, um, in the chat box, everyone, please feel free to chat any questions or ideas that you maybe do yourself with um, early literacy programming for summer reading. Um, and as Eva mentioned, Touch the Brightest Star is our 2019 Ready to Read Michigan Book, program book. So you'll be getting a programming guide and all that great information on Touch the Brightest Star um, by end of January, early February uh, at your library, and then it will make for great programming come summer. So that is going to be available, uh, like I said, this winter uh, from the Library of Michigan, and it's a great play into a universe of stories. And now we're going to move on to the children's manual. And as I just mentioned, please do feel free to type any questions or um, ideas in the chat box here. I'll be reading them off as we go today. In the children's manual, um, you will find, of course, the typical planning and promoting um, chapters that they provide. So in the planning guide, there is uh, information on serving food, using volunteers, registration, different reporting ideas. There's also um, school visit ideas 
And then we go into the five theme chapters, which provide programming, reproducibles, websites, all that great stuff. Um, they have been very cognizant of the all the apps that are out there these days. And so they've tried to provide apps um, that you might be able to use in programming uh, for summer reading. And of course, there are inclusion and literacy tips highlighted throughout. And speaking of inclusion, this is normally where Stephanie Wamba would share with us. Um, she's with the Braille and Talking Book Library. And, you know, some simple ideas for inclusion is uh, just using texture um, in your crafts, um, providing like flour or rice to make things lumpy um, as you paint. You can have sticky things like caro syrup and shaving cream. Um, make those all part of your crafts. Um, make sure that you have both visual and verbal instructions for activities. So if you have stations set up, much like we were just talking about for the early literacy activities, having stations, make sure you have maybe some visual posters um, hanging above those stations, as well as giving your verbal instructions uh, as you begin each project. And then um, providing an example of a finished product, I know a lot of parents will often look for perfecting, um, you know, helping their child perfect that finished product to look like maybe your example. So I'm always uh, making sure that I remind parents to let their children create and how fun it is to see how unique and different um, every craft comes out. Um, and of course, you don't need to start from scratch in the CSLP manual. There are adaptions um, to uh, some of their activities. So for example, they have board games throughout the chapter, uh, the, uh, throughout the children's manual. Um, those adaptations are on page 91. And then for station-based activities, you'll find adaptations on pages 95, 208, and 212, as well as inclusion tips throughout every single chapter. And then uh, Stephanie just wants to remind you all that um, there are different um, visual impairments, autism spectrum, physical disabilities. There are different um, disabilities people are coming in with. So know your audience and be ready to adjust um, accordingly. And she provided this link here to the disability adequate. Um, so, you know, to ask before you're, you help. Don't just make assumptions. Don't jump in and, and start helping without asking. It might just take some people a little while longer to get going on something. They're not necessarily waiting for help. Um, use inclusive language in all your promotions. Um, some people are using little symbols like a, a person in a wheelchair zooming off. Um, some most people uh, include just simple language, such as people of all abilities are welcome. And then use person first language. So by person first language, that means putting the person before the mention of the disability. So for example, a student with a visual impairment, um, you're gonna wanna say student with disability, with visual impairment, as opposed to saying something like visually impaired student. Um, so you don't want to say cancer patient, you want to say patient suffering with cancer. Um, so make sure you use person first language and a strong reminder to use large print. You want to definitely use things above 14 font. All right, so I believe I'm handing this over to Jillian. Is that correct? She's still there. Whose slide is it? Shoot for the moon. I forgot. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to figure out where the mute That's, button went to. <laughs> it is really, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Um, I was like, where's the mute button? It disappears once you share. Um, fun fact. All right. Well, Shoot for the Moon is the uh, name of, uh, well, pretty much, I think, the entirety of Chapter 4, or pretty close to it. There, It's, well, maybe not in the entirety, but it's a very prominent collection of activities in chapter four of the manual and there are some really fun activities you can do related specifically to the lunar landing since um, this is the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing this year uh, there's a whole lot of really cool resources a lot of great books um, and of course i left off the resource section but i can definitely recommend uh, team moon 
uh, is the title of one particularly good book that talked about all the uh, people that worked together to make the lunar landing happen on the ground. Um, mission control, all the people who um, made the calculations for the, sh for the launch and for the trajectory for return, all that fun stuff. There's a whole lot more than just that book, but that's one that just stands out. Uh, so here we kind of had, I had an idea about a multiple station activity for elementary school students, maybe third to fifth, but I think this would be very adjustable depending on your interest levels. There's a whole lot of other activities covered in the chapter from rockets to trying to make your own craters that ties back into the idea of having more texture in an activity. That could be a very good opportunity if you're trying to make an inclusive program. Um, the first activity I have listed here though, uh, Lunar Survival Station, is one that we did in um, our, our co-ops um, summer, reading, summer reading showcase kind of thing. And we, t we, because we're librarians, it was a short activity. <laughs> we're all very organized and collaborative and we figured out pretty quickly in a crash situation on the moon, you have certain materials that you've been provided that were on your ship and you have to get from the place that you've crashed to uh, your moon base. And the sorts of things that you have, you have them all listed on cards. Um, and you have to have a discussion as a group, as a team, which things do you take with you and which things do you leave behind? Which things are going to be most useful for you? Um, navigating an area where there's not major landmarks necessarily, not necessarily ones you're used to. There are stars to navigate by, but you need a star chart for that. Um, you can take an oxygen tank. It can be a very heavy oxygen tank because you're on the moon. It's not going to weigh much, but, you know. What sort of things do you need? Do you need matches on the moon? That was not difficult for our group, but apparently was a, a big source of contention for someone who had actually used it in a, in a kid's setting. Um, there was a lot of argument, especially over like whether or not they needed matches or water or other survival things in a moon setting. So that's a good opportunity to kind of help kids think a little outside the box and to... Um, just kind of adapt their thinking to a new setting. Um, it's also a good opportunity to, to point out here at the end, I've added a modifier that while this is the anniversary for the lunar landing, this is also a good opportunity to maybe explore current events um, going on with NASA, such as the InSight rover, which takes us over to the next section, lunar rovers. Uh, page 124 has a whole activity listing on creating your own lunar rover. There's an adaptation where you can create a lunar rover simply as kind of a piece of art and you can talk about the different things that a lunar rover does how they work that they take samples do they have an arm how are their wheels designed so that they can handle the terrain um, and then you can take cardboard tape uh, other recyclable materials and create your own lunar rovers there's also the opportunity if you have the resources to maybe adapt um, Oh, what is it called? Um, like an RC vehicle or something like that. Maybe a little um, remote controlled car or something. And create a, a rover eye view of maybe your library. Um, that could be really fun. But again, that's going to be something that's going to be dependent on what resources you have and what you're interested in doing. And if you can stabilize a cell phone on top of an RV. Um, the next section, <clears throat> pardon me, Robots Rove the Moon. Um, there's a really great activity described on page 127 about using either an Ozobot or a Sphero robot. Um, I was racking my brain though because while the description here, navigating a rover with the directions, depending on what kind of bot you use, because each of those requires different programming inputs to accomplish a task, um, having kids use that bot and trying to navigate it on a table set up with kind of a generalized map of the Sea of Tranquility to get it from one point to another, um, which is a really fun way for kids to explore an actual map. If you can adapt that map somewhat to a table, um, big sheet of paper, you know, a lot of butcher paper for that. That can be really cool. Um, but again, that's gonna be something that's gonna be dependent on if you have access to an Ozobot. Um, you can also adapt at the end there. I've got something for another RC vehicle, maybe with um, slightly less powered controls. 
I just remember RC vehicles always kind of going zoom as soon as you hit the controls. They would either go not very fast or suddenly like 60 miles an hour um, when I was a kid. I think you could maybe adapt this to be a robot free activity if you declared somebody, maybe a friendly handy librarian, as your robot or your rover and have the kids give directions maybe on a modified version of Twister. So red means turn left, you know, blue means turn right, um, different things like that. So that you could still have the experience of a rover, but not necessarily require actual robotics in case that's not within your resources at the time. And finally, uh, moon craters. This is another one that we had demonstrated at our uh, co-op activity. Um, this is on page 130, and you can actually do layers. This is something I don't remember us discussing when we studied the moon when I was a kid. You can put together a shallow box with different layers of dust. You, you know, flour, cornstarch. You want things that are distinct in color, though, so flour and cornstarch together, not so great. Maybe flour, cocoa, cornstarch or cornmeal. If you mess too much with the texture of the powder, that's going to be an issue though for the activity that comes next. This is, by the way, an outside activity or a, wow, you have really big tarps activity because this is going to get dust everywhere. The person that demonstrated for us did flour, cornstarch, and black tempera powder. I don't recommend tempera powder personally <laughs> unless you are outside because that stuff is potent. But then you use different um, act, um, objects like marbles, ping pong balls, uh, baseball, and those are your asteroids striking the lunar surface. And then you get to observe the different changes in layer and see the depths of the craters created and kind of talk about that um, interaction in space as it actually happens. And of course, kids like throwing a ball at something and seeing its effect, especially when there's a big poof of powder. So these are some different activities that you could definitely discuss some fun science facts and uh, some fun things that connect to not just science but history so thank you cool. Jillian um, you had a question on the oh, lunar please. Oh, I'm survival sorry. I missed station that. that's okay yes. that's why I'm here uh, lunar survival station um, do you have um, any list of items or a cheat sheet for um, why some items were good or not good choices for that? Um, I can contact my uh, friend who has that resource and I can either, I don't know if I can post it to the slides after the fact or if I can just send it to you, but I can get it out. Um, why don't you send it to me and we'll get it out to the attendees. All right. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you. And a great reminder that yes, a universe of stories, um, that theme, the space theme and slogan were chosen because 2019 is the 50th anniversary of um, landing on the moon. So um, a great slide to have there um, as we look to celebrate that anniversary in 2019. All right, now we have Annie. Um, she is going to be speaking to us about a few ideas here. Annie? Hi, Kathy. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Annie Clark, and I'm a children's librarian at Bay County Library System. This is um, a program I did last winter break called Astronaut Training Cam. Um, I pulled it together as a station-based activity program. Um, got lots of ideas from the internet, so I'm happy to pass on what I've learned. It's kind of going to go down the list in order. Um, we did take about an hour for this program and I had 30 kids come just to give you an idea. So um, the stations were throughout the room. The, the first one I want to talk about is Lost in Space, which we did um, a ball pit search. So um, I used stress balls shaped like the earth and hid them with regular ball pit balls in one of our large plastic swimming pools. Um, we had regular toys in there too, and the kids got to keep one toy that they found. So you could do astronauts or aliens or whatever you had. Another one, this is my personal favorite, was right like an astronaut. So we had folding tables set up. And if you see those pla um, plastic chairs in the picture on the left of the screen, the kid, they, they were on their backs. So the kids were, had to lay down on the ground, take a pencil, and paper and hold it over their head on the table and I had them write their name. Um, 
Then another table that we had set up was astronaut portrait crafts. So I used our Ellison die machine and punched out a bunch of fishbowl shapes. And then I had the kids turn them upside down and draw pictures of their face in an astronaut um, headpiece. Um, the kids' personal favorite was indisputably the alien walk that you see in the left of the screen. That was an obstacle course put together. There's masking tape on the floor for them to follow. We used alien feet stilts from Amazon. The brand is Toy Smith and they called them monster feet, but we dubbed them alien feet. Another fun challenge that we had was robot arms. So the children used one of those um, toy robot arms to move objects from a container to um, the other side of the table. So they had to walk a couple of feet apart. We found that um, some objects were easier than others and it was quite fun testing things to see what worked better and what didn't work at all. We also had a space photo scavenger hunt. We do scavenger hunts at lots of our programs. I used NASA images and cut up and hid them around the room. They had a checklist and when they were done, they could turn it in to win uh, space, space temporary tattoos. Uh, another game that we had in the corner was a planetary ring toss game. I used some large traffic cones and, that we had around the room, put out um, taped up clip art of planets to them. And then the kids tossed plastic rings over the tops of the cones. And then when they finished all the stations, they got a pre-printed um, junior astronaut certificate certification that I made on Canva and I'm happy to share any of the files from this program. I put my email address right there if anybody wants to email me and ask for them. Very fun, Annie. I, I think I have to agree I would enjoy the alien walk. <laughs> it was really fun and hard. Very fun. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for sharing these ideas. Um, and we're going to move on here to Liz. I can see she's trying to advance the slide. There we go. Liz, can you unmute yourself? All right. Here I am. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Liz Clowder. I work at the Bloomfield Township Public Library and I'm one of the youth services librarians. And um, we had a family fortnight event um, earlier this year and then we also had one a couple years ago. Um, we've done these in February, but I don't see any reason you couldn't do them in the summertime as well. You know, it might not be dark outside if you're doing it just after the library closes. Um, you could push it later or it could still just be, I think, another fun thing to do indoors. But um, we, even though it's early, uh, we invited all ages families to come to the library and they could bring their own blankets and sheets to create a fort where they could read. Um, they could enjoy some snacks, which we provided. Um, we got out some different games that we have um, in the collection and ones that we just keep for special events, um, just as an invitation to use the library in a different way. Uh, I know one of the years we got out a little fake campfire and had that available. Um, we got out all kinds of different books about nighttime and camping, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, we would host this on a Friday night, um, right when the library closed. And then um, it was about an hour and a half. So they could be in the room for an hour and a half, explore different spaces. We just limited it to the youth room. So not the entire library. Um, but if you have the space and you want to, you could open it up to whatever. And um, we made sure that there were some areas um, where there was a lot of light available and then other areas of the room where it was a little bit darker, just depending on the needs. You know, some of the kids that would can't come with their families were pretty little and, you know, maybe they didn't want to be in the dark. They just wanted to set up their fort and have a good time. And other people were like, put us in the darkest spot. We have our own uh, twinkle lights that we brought with us. And they made like these elaborate forts with little twinkle lights and just relaxed in the stacks and had the best time. Um, we served indoor s'mores at our uh, family fortnights, which were just like 
either graham cracker sticks or the little teddy grams, um, mini marshmallows and chocolate chips just mixed up together in a bowl and then we put them in little cups. And then we had um, little mini bottles of water um, or you could give out cups if you have a drinking fountain just so people have an option. Um, and then we have had student volunteers help with the event too just because it's nice to have a few extra bodies in the room just to keep an eye on things and make sure everybody's, you know, being respectful still. Um, and they helped pass out snacks and clean up at the end. Um, we had, you know, some binder clips that, you know, anyone could use, some, some masking tape so that, you know, they could tape up anything and not damage it. We got out in the picture on the lower left, you can see um, we got out our big parachute and there's, you know, our, one of our big stuffed tigers there. Um, so we just kind of got out some things that you normally wouldn't be able to interact with in the library and, um, the kids had a great time. We had over 70 attendees each time we ran this, which was pretty good for us for not knowing what to expect. We kept it drop in and um, it was just a blast. So um, this almost this exact same event is in the CSLP children's manual um, marketed as a library camp in on page 163. Um, but there is kind of a related activity, um, duct tape engineering on page 88 that um, I think that they take just like rolled up newspaper and different, a couple different kinds of tape. And um, there's instructions on there to like make a really cool dome, which I was like, oh, that's another idea. Or you could do that as part of this event. Um, sounded like a good time. So that is Family Fortnite. Um, and then I have an additional program idea. I haven't done this myself, but I know um, a librarian that I worked with who retired a few years ago, she ran her own Starry Night art workshop. Um, she did hers a little bit differently, but there's so many variations. I just did like a quick internet search to like, okay, what could you do? There's so much out there. So um, the Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh is a big famous painting that some kids might already know about. Um, you could market a program to you know, young children, or you could go tweens, you could go somewhere in between or all ages. Um, just a couple ideas here. Um, there's a link in the CSLP Children's Manual for crayon and watercolor recreations of Starry Night. And there's like a, yeah, little example there on the top left. Um, there's another page in the manual that outlines um, using like a tempera or acrylic paint with glue added to thicken it and it'll show the brush strokes a little more. Um, and that, I, I hadn't done that before, so I thought that was kind of a cool option. Um, there is a book that I found in our collection called The Starry Night by Neil Waldman. And it has in the end papers, a lot of really cool like drawings with markers and colored pencils and other things that I'm like, oh, those are really cool drawings actually. So if they wanted to go literal of like, we're gonna make our own versions of this uh, famous painting. Those are just a few ideas, but I think you could also, you know, check your collection and see if there's other good universe star night space type artworks that you could show the kids and then just give them supplies and be like, hey, here's some stuff and maybe a couple, show them a couple methods that the way that the watercolor resists the wax of a crayon is kind of cool. So. I like that, but um, you could take it in, uh, like I said, a number of directions. I think our librarian here did um, like strips of tissue paper torn and kind of overlapped and glued and it was this whole big beautiful thing. So there's, there's a lot of ideas out there. Great, thank you so much, Liz. And um, in the chat box, I also added um, the Starnet Libraries site. Um, they have a clearinghouse full of activities, including um, ideas much like the Starry Night Art Workshop that Liz just shared. So make sure you check out clearinghouse.starnetlibraries.org for that. All right, so we have Kaylin up next. Kaylin, um, we don't hear you. Are you able to unmute? Oops. It looks like we might have just lost her. I'm having trouble seeing her. There she is. Kaylin? All right. She's controlling the screen. Can you say something? <laughs> OK. 
Can you hear me? There you go. Okay, good. Okay, Finally. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance if I have to stop and cough. Um, I've got a little bit of a cold going on. Um, and I'm going to fly through these slides just in the interest of time. So um, my name is Kaylin Christian. I'm the head of youth services at the Georgetown Township Public Library in Jenison, Michigan. Um, my my tweens and kids um, really like craft-based programs. So one thing I'm planning to do with them um, is these galaxy jars. There are honestly a ton of different ways to do this and there are a million recipes online. Um, but the best is one that just uses um, mason jars and cotton balls, glitter, paint, water, um, you, the directions are all right there. You fill the cup with water and then you put in some paint and mix it up, um, so that it's the, you know, colored water. And then you pull the cotton balls apart so that they get really fluffy, um, and put them in the water Then add some glitter. And then you add another layer of a different color, things like that. Um, one that I have heard a alternative to cotton balls that works really well. I've heard, I haven't tried it yet. Um, is to use diaper filling um, and use that instead of the cotton balls to soak up the color. I've heard it looks really cool um, and is a good alternative. So if you've got extra diapers lying around, um, that might be a good idea. Um, and then let's see if I can get to the next slide. Um, oh, what did I do? Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so another one monthly program that we do is um, the a Mad Scientist Club. And we do a different theme every month. One that we have done in the past is balloon rockets. Um, and this theme for summer reading seems like a really great time to do a whole bunch of different rockets. You can use the vinegar and baking soda that uses the chemical reaction. You can do balloon rockets with the, um, with, you know, the power coming from the balloon when you let it go. Straw rockets, all sorts of different um, things like that. And talk about the different propulsion types, especially the types that they used, that they use in um, different spacecrafts and what provides more power um, and why it might be better to use one type of propulsion over another. Um, and then a fun idea that I think I'll have the kids do is test the rockets, like have rocket races and put a balloon rocket against a vinegar and baking soda rocket, or the straw rocket, um, and just have them have fun with which one works better. Wonderful, Kaylin, thank you. And um, I would, I personally would love to see some of those uh, races on social media, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Make sure you use that library's lift off hashtag. <laughs> All right, so I've given control over to Dina and we'll let her get started on her activity. I can see that it's kind of um, switch slides. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry, as soon as you gave me the screen, it took away the button for unmuting, so I think that's what happened. Oh. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm Dina Moschek. I'm the head of Children's Services for the Lapeer District Library in the western part of Lapeer County. Um, I plan all of our children's programming at our main branch. We also have six smaller branches that are open limited hours, so I help advise their children's programming, too. Um, as a few other people have said, I'm really excited about this theme, too, thanks to the fact that um, I have a family of space buffs um, with telescopes, and we've always been really into, into space in my family, so I think it's going to be a really cool theme. So I coordinate a lot of our summer library program, especially the children's part of it, but also for the past few years, I've done our overall marketing brochure and gotten a chance to look at our entire slate of programs um, while everybody else is in the planning stages, and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about today instead of just one program. So at our six smaller branches, our branch managers participate in our umbrella summer program for each age group for children's teen and adult 
um, and they do all of their own local programming and special events as well. But this year we're trying something new and all the departments are working together to try to coordinate district-wide special programming across all of our age groups. Um, and so hopefully we'll be including our branches in that too. So what we did was we looked at the calendar for how we usually plan summer reading. Um, we usually do a seven week program from the end of the school year through the first week of August. And we found that the dates worked really well to kind of designate three themed weeks as a way to organize all of our different ideas. So the idea is we'll do a bunch of programs during each of those weeks. Um, one of the weeks will relate to the sun, one for the moon, and the last one, um, the stars, the universe, space in general. And then we'll try to or offer programs for each age group on that theme and as many programs as possible during those themed weeks. So as you can see on my slide, the first week of our summer reading, um, the week of June 17th to 21st, it conveniently ends with the summer solstice. So that's gonna be our sun week. Um, for each of the weeks, we have an opportunity to look at it from lots of perspectives so that we can adapt things for lots of age groups. A lot of the ideas other people have, have given already um, in the webinars, you know, can be adapted for these weeks too. Um, so I'm probably going to be stealing a lot of the great ideas that have already been shared. Um, but I'm mostly going to be talking not um, from a children's department standpoint. Um, so some of the ideas we've had have been to look at different solstice, summer solstice traditions. So um, there's a link, although I'm not sure if um, it's clickable in the webinar. Um, a link that's included with lots of ideas. Some of the ones I liked best were to have a program to let patrons plant a flower or making crafts like sun, catch sun catchers and flower crowns um, or even um, educational programs about Stonehenge. Um, I also plan to get lots of use out of the ideas in the webinar and also um, in the NASA kit that um, the NASA kits that Library of Michigan has. Um, I have one of them checked out right now and I'm using it to get lots of ideas to use throughout the summer, um, both for the sun theme and, and the moon and stars as well. Just so you know, Dina, I did put that link in the chat box for all of our attendees to see. Well, cool, thank you. I saw it's it the, popped up, it kind of distracted me for a second. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's the rhythmsofplay.com site. Yeah, and I mean, there are other there are other websites certainly too, but I just liked that because it had lots, it had a list of 18 different ideas specifically for the summer solstice, which is something I've never done programming about before. So lots of good ideas there. So the second theme week we're doing is all about the moon. Um, as we've said before, it's um, summer reading is coinciding with the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing. So um, in the children's department, um, we're going to be having a lunar rover class. We'll be doing moon phase activities. Again, like I said, lots of ideas in the NASA kit. Um, we're also really lucky, and actually you guys are too, that there is a full moon that happens that week. It's on Tuesday, July 16th. So I'm hoping to do an after hours full moon viewing party with some local telescope owners um, and look at the moon and its craters through telescopes or binoculars because that can be really cool for people. And then the last week of our summer reading program um, is the first week of August and that's going to be our star and universe week. We're planning a family program to create a scale model of the solar system. We're having a tween rocket launch party that week um, with the Sloan Museum and if we can make it work we're hoping to have a late night star party to close out summer reading and have telescopes available. There's a new moon that week so it's some of the darkest sky available for stargazing so it gives um, people an opportunity to see things through a telescope that they might not ordinarily see but it also would have to be pretty late at night since the sun sets so late in the middle of summer so we're still working on the details for that but we're hoping we can make it happen because I think it would be really cool. Um, spacing out all of our programs over the course of these weeks offers our branches the chance to participate since some of them are closed. You know if we picked one day it might be that three of our branches are closed that day so um, doing them over the course of the week gives everybody a chance to do stuff um, and it gives us a great way to kind of market the entire week's worth of programs to our patrons. They're also um, um, spaced out nicely on our calendar in June, July, and August, so we're not saturating the entire summer with heavily planned themed weeks. Kind of gives us a chance to take a breather and have a quieter week every once in a while too, which is always nice. Thanks for That's great. Thank you, Dina. And um, I did put in the chat box there that 
July 20th is the 50th anniversary, and I did not realize there was a full moon that week. So that's you know, fantastic. I thought that was super cool. <laughs> you know, I was just looking at the calendar just to figure out, you know, does it make sense to do it this way? And the fact that there's a full moon. And then the new moon during the first week of August, too. Like I said, it means we have to do it kind of late at night. And but For stargazing, yeah. 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 Get a good view. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Dina. Um, so now we're going to move on to our teens. Um, just real quick, the teen manual, of course, um, is accessible at cslpreads.org. And it has a deep dive at the beginning um, on why we should be doing summer reading for teens. Um, I also wanted to highlight that this year, for the first time ever, the teen video contest will actually be in the summer and teens are encouraged to submit their own videos online um, and the videos are to be no more than 60 seconds long and they can use any format that they're used to so if they want to do an Instagram video they want to do um, a Facebook live video and have save a link to that um, they can use whatever format they want and of course YouTube is always um, welcome as well and um, there is going to be a flyer online um, on CSLP reads there'll be a flyer that libraries will be able to hang up and promote the teen video contest so it's a little more hands-off for uh, the teen librarian if they don't want to be hands-on with it. Um, of course, um, I would strongly encourage you that you work with your teens uh, to create a video to submit to the teen video contest. Um, but there'll be lots of great prizes, um, including a $50 gift certificate from Upstart Demco to the teen's choice of public library. So the teen that submits their video, if they're a winner, um, they'll get a prize, um, $200 cash prize, as well as um, encouraging um, or picking, excuse me, a public library to contribute that certificate to. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Monica. And Monica? Hi. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> Hi there. Um, so my name is Monica Porter and I am an information resources supervisor um, at University of Michigan and I work for the Shapiro Undergraduate Library. Um, I am also a substitute librarian at Ypsilanti District Library. And so we've already, I have three ideas for teen programming. Um, we already kind of discussed one which was um, making a video which YouTube and um, having um, teen, uh, teens be very engaging and interactive um, because they like to be creative and they like to be innovative and they like to be considered. So I tried to develop or come up with programs that would um, involve um, teens. Um, so one pro program um, I suggestion is design a web page about space for your peers. Um, so you can kind of just like make it free. So um, you can have um, the teens, um, if you want to do outreach or something like that and connect to like um, a college library um, to set up, or if you have a, a lab at your library um, to have teens kind of design a, um, a web page or help design a web page for their library's web page, a public library's web page, um, and use Teen Advisory Board as judges. Or even if you don't have a Teen Advisory Board, you can kind of encourage you know teens that use your space and maybe have them be um, judges. Um, and then another one is a Space Film Festival which is a cool way of getting um, teens to relax and watch movies about space. So I have like five movies listed, um, like Moon, Apollo 13, um, Hidden Figures, um, and then maybe follow that up with a discussion about space. Um, yeah, so that's it. Um, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but if you have any questions um, about or ideas, if you want some 
more creative ideas, you can reach me at monicadp at umich.edu. Great. Thank you, Monica. And of course, Hidden Figures is like one of my new all-time favorites. <laughs> and it's so fun to watch with a group and lots of great discussion can be followed up with that. Yes. Um, Lindsay, I'm going to pass it on to you. Hi there. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Lindsay Goichai. I'm an information services librarian with a focus on tween and teen services at the Novi Public Library. Um, just a couple of fun programs for tween and teens this summer. Um, we have a virtual reality system here at our library that's been really popular. Um, we run it for ages 12 and up due to the recommended age guidelines on the virtual reality system itself. There's a couple games if you just simply Google virtual reality games for whatever system you own, it'll come up with a lot of different things. Um, we've been playing around with Astrobot Rescue Mission, which is rated E. And there's another one called Valkyrie Eve, which is for teens. Um, both of those seem pretty fun. We typically have that either after school as a drop-in program. We've also done after hours programs with virtual reality where we serve pizza um, and ice cream and other snacks and that goes over really well. Um, so that's just a really fun program. Uh, another one that I found online is the DIY CD spaceship craft. The tweens and the teens are, at my library really enjoy uh, take home making a library craft. Um, and in this specific craft, the materials are mostly ones that you would have laying around your library. Um, you can follow that link, which is the education.com. Um, it's an old CD, toothpicks, a hot glue gun, aluminum foil, permanent markers, or paint. And instead of a, it lists that you can use a tennis ball or a rubber ball, but I would prefer that you just use um, a styrofoam ball because they're a lot cheaper unless you happen to have other things laying around that you want to use. Um, and when you click on that website, you can see um, a picture of how the little spaceship would look and it's pretty cool um, for the tweens to make out of recycled items. Um, we also, I think Dina mentioned this as well, we also have a NASA kit that we just tested out a couple of weeks ago at our library. And in, the, in our kit, we had different activities that would be great crafts for the tween ages. So we advertised that as a STEM hands-on program. And some of the things that we did that could also be good for the summer space theme is we made mini earths using styrofoam balls, tissue paper, and glue. We did measuring moon craters where we had um, baskets of flour and then we dropped different sizes and different shaped objects of different weights from different heights using yardsticks. And then we had the kids, the kids measure their impacts of the moon craters in the flour. Um, we also did a UV ray person using pipe cleaners, straws, beads, and foil. And that was, uh, a lot of these ideas came from not only the kit, but also the NASA training through the Library of Michigan. And they have a ton of different ideas um, that are really helpful. Um, another good program that we find to be really popular with our tween age and could work for teens as well is Space Trivia. So in the past, we've used different books in the library, as well as online resources to come up with questions similar to Jeopardy style. Um, this is a sign up program and then we divide the kids into different groups um, to form a team. And then we just ask the questions and then we give some prizes. Um, that's also a great way to highlight your collection and to show the kids how to use the Dewey Decimal System. And they also want to come and check out the books, which is another reason why it's helpful to use your books to create your questions. Um, and another popular program that I don't have listed on the slide is our Pizza and Pages monthly book club for tweens. And we read different themed books depending on if there's something special going on in the library. This year, the city of Novi is actually celebrating their 50th anniversary as well. So we are going to be part doing both type of partnerships um, with the city and their celebration as well as the, the moon celebration. So for our book club, we're going to be reading a lot of space related books. So we're going to be doing Space Case by Stuart Gibbs. 
Mars Evacuees by Sophia McDougall and The Last Day on Mars by Kevin Emerson. If anybody has any questions about anything, my email's on there um, for any, anything that you guys want to know. Thanks. Thank you, Lindsay, and thanks for the shout out about the NASA at my library workshops. <laughs> we had a lot of fun in September with those. Uh, here we have our summer health programming manual. Um, I just wanted to note that it is available um, online as one of the downloads. Um, and it's from the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. And so they're really excited. They worked with some public library partners to develop a few programs, um, including Food in Space and We Are All Made of Stardust. Um, they also list videos, games, and additional resources. So be sure to take a look at that manual um, on CSLP Reads as well. And here again um, is information how to access these slides, the bit.ly at the top there, and um, all of our names and contact information is available here as well. So um, we've reached three o'clock exactly, um, and I've got a few questions here. So those of you that want to stay on and share any ideas in the chat, I can start reading those off. Um, one of our questions is, um, how do I see the manuals? Um, so J desk there, I'm going to share my screen. Let me move this bar here. Um, if you go to cslpreads.org, there is a login on the top right. And um, hopefully you can see my screen right now as I hover over that. I am logged in. And as my letter that went out to all public libraries mentioned, you do have to go to the manual downloads and you will have to obtain the 2019 online access code. So the first thing you need to do is set up your account and CSLP will confirm that for you and you can log in. Once you log in, you're going to go to manual downloads. You're going to obtain that 2019 online access code. Once you have that access code, you'll be able to access the 2019 online manual. I'm just gonna click on that real quick here so you can all see it. I, you'll be asked to type in your code, I already did that. And here we go, here's an entire folder of art. I hear, um, I see this question on chat, so that's where I'm heading right now there. Um, you can see the full manuals are available and you can download the full um, manual. Um, as well as our rules of your use um, and games. And then down here at the very bottom, we have a file browser and we have art. There are um, folders here that you can drop down and you can download, of course, something one at a time. This way, if you only need a few pieces, that's one way to do it. But there is also a zip file with all the art up here on the right, there's narrow search results. And you can download um, an entire um, file through this. So like the Lisa Hernandez, I want all her color and I want it in JPEGs. Oops, it's not popping up. I'm sorry. There is a file browser um, to our, our attendee who's asking about this, and I'm sorry, it's not coming up for me right there, but I thought that was how I did it. So I'm going to double check with CSLP and make sure that they, they get that for us because it's not automatically downloading it, and that's what it should do. So sorry about that, <laughs> but there is a zip file with all the art in it um, and I'll make sure I get that information out to you as well. So any other questions? It looks pretty quiet. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Thank you all for joining us today and a big thank you to all of our panelists on the Youth Services Advisory Council.